peak oil myth, <coughs> complex element series, the acceleration of globalisation and its effects on us, and lots more. Just some of the venues he has spoken at include AV1, AV2, Glastonbury Symposium, Rome, here. Visit Ian Crane at iancrane.co.uk for more dynamic information. He deals in evidence-based research and tonight focuses on our currently rapidly changing situation of house price crashes, MPs expenses, swine flu, lovely Mr Blair, the end of Westminster and the increasing stage of the new world order. With, are we being lied to? Oh yeah, I've just been reminded about it. He's currently a recipient of the 2009 Health Freedom Hero Award, along with none other than Senator Ron Paul. So, here tonight, are we being lied to? So what are we going to do about it? Please welcome Ian Gray. We'll just get the levels back um, set up on this. But uh, thank you very much, great uh, turnout. I think the last time I, I spoke here at New Horizons, it, I seem to remember it was like midsummer, and it was a beautiful, scorching day. And um, we had probably about half this number. And I totally understand that, because given the choice, I'd have been on the beach too. <laughs> and so, so you, this time of year, it's been a lovely day, but uh, not quite so hot. So thanks very much for coming out. Um, Thanks for the introduction now. I just want to uh, perhaps iterate, because it was almost a slip there. If you visit iancrane.co.uk, you will actually end up on an estate agent's website in Liverpool. <laughs> which is why I use Ian R. Crane. I'm not about to tell you what the R stands for, you'll have to work that out actually yourself. <laughs> but uh, that's the reason I use it, and every time I get sort of uh, email forwarded from him, he's always very courteous and uh, very polite. But he's probably the best educated estate agent in, uh, in the country. <laughs> there is another Ian Crane who actually lives very close to where I used to live on in Suffolk many, many years ago. And whenever he forwards emails to me, he always signs himself the original Ian Crane. <laughs> but he's four years older than me. Mm. Interesting enough, there was another Ian Crane I discovered who was actually uh, a little older today, but. Back in um, 2001, he was uh, a young schoolboy in Kansas, in uh, Wichita, Kansas. And um, ironically, he had an art, a piece of his art was being displayed in the World Trade Center on 9-11, which I thought was an interesting piece of synchronicity. So, tonight's nice talk, we are being lied to, or is the Pope Catholic, you know, whichever you prefer. And so what are we going to do about it? And the emphasis is on the we, but actually the emphasis is really on the I, because I don't actually uh, suggest that we need to form organisations, we need to form groups, or anything like that. In fact, that's actually, in my opinion, the last thing we need to be doing, because what I've learned through bitter experience, if you like, although not so bitter, but when I was the inaugural chairman of the 9-11 Truth Movement in this country, it took me just a few months to realise that the organisation was infiltrated. And, and it's still infiltrated, basically, although well, it doesn't really exist today. But the manifestation of that was, I was certainly, I think, the first person to be giving public presentations on the issues and my concerns surrounding 9-11 in this country. I, I gave my first public presentation in January 2004. Um, and I became chairman of the 9-11 Truth Movement, I think, in um, late 2005. Well, in the 18 months prior to that, I, would, I had given something in the region of about 25, 30 presentations on 9-11. Having become chairman of the 9-11 Truth Movement, voted chairman of the 9-11 Truth Movement, here in Blackpool, interestingly, over the next few months, I didn't do any presentations. I was spending less time on research and more time answering bullshit emails. And this is the way the infiltration works. Basically, there are certain individuals who are effectively assigned to keep the organisation bogged down in bullshit. Now, it took me uh, 18 months to effectively extricate myself from that role, 
I mean, I had announced that I would not stand for re-election, and a certain few individuals managed to postpone the AGM for a further six months, which is why I ended up in there for 18 months. And I decided to hang it out. It was an education, that's for sure. But then, as soon as I was out of the 9-11 uh, Truth Movement, then I was able to get back into full-time research, presentations, and actually I moved on from 9-11 because I decided that there were other people now who were pursuing the 9-11 issue, and I started to focus much more on the bigger picture. Because 9-11 is just one part of what is occurring. It's a very important part, there's no doubt about that. But it's just one part. And what I'm going to show you tonight is a very, in an hour and a half or so, we're going to cover a lot of ground, look at a lot of different issues, and I'm going to try and show you how they are all connected. And the one thing that I can absolutely assure you is that the architects, the scriptwriters of all these events do not have our best interests at heart. I don't think there's too many of you that would probably doubt that. So 9-11, I mean, it's been back in the media, funnily enough, because obviously we're at the 8th anniversary. And the media, the mainstream media, would have us believe that in reality, the vast majority of people still believe the, the official version of events. Now, outside of North America, that may be true. But inside North America, it's absolutely not true. And Charlie Sheen has once again reared his head, and this is from the paper last Friday on the anniversary, where Charlie Sheen actually sent a message to Obama inviting him to discuss the issue and to re-establish an investigation. So we have a page, a page, as you can see, it got very close to the front of the media, it's page 47. <laughs> no surprise there. But nonetheless, they did give him half a page. America was behind the 9-11 atrocities, says Sheen. And, of course, you know, Charlie, Charlie Sheen is immediately demonized as a drug addict and a wife beater, which of course he is. He's admitted that. But, you know, he's got beyond that. And that was the first time around. But now this is the second time around, so it's going to be interesting to see what kind of reaction. Now this is a, a poll from CNN that I managed to capture the first time he raised his head above the parapet on the issue of 9-11. And CNN put up this quick vote poll. Do you agree with Charlie Sheen that the US government covered up the real events in 9-11? And this was like day one of the poll being up on the web. And let me look at where it was. Yes, 84%, 34,692 votes. No, 16%, 6,757 votes. Well, it was pretty obvious where this poll was going, so the next day it was removed. And this is telling the US government, basically, that you know, the people are not happy and are seeing through their lies and their bullshit. And some of the situations that we see in the US, which we're going to go into a little bit deeper through the course of the evening, I think are a direct reflection of this. The fact that the US government, or the secret government, the power behind the government, is beginning to realise that their lies and their bullshit are becoming transparent. So when you see that in Massachusetts there is legislation before the Senate to make it an offence to refuse the instruction of a state healthcare professional in the event of a declared emergency, leading to fines of $1,000 a day or imprisonment. And the same legislation has today been announced that it will be put before the Senate in Oklahoma. And the proposals in the Senate in Oklahoma go even further, stating basically that in the event of a person refusing to follow the instruction of a healthcare professional, they will be quarantined. And there is an interview that's already up on YouTube with an individual who basically says that he has evidence that in Oklahoma, if people refuse to follow the instruction of a healthcare professional, and I'm sure you know what we're talking about here, it's a swine flu vaccination, then if they, if they have a swine flu vaccination, they will be given a RFID wristband, which they will be required to wear at all times. And if they refuse, they will be quarantined into one of the chain of FEMA camps. So of course in the 1970s it was Alexander Solzhenitsyn who made the Gulag Archipelago um, 
famous? Well, we're about to realize that there is very definitely a Goulet archipelago in the US, run by FEMA, who have a budget of 200, well, sorry, run by FEMA, who have contracted Halliburton to build and maintain these camps. And Halliburton have a budget of $250 million a year. Now, as um, James rightly you know, reminded me earlier today, you know, we are only 30 years or so away from the days when people mysteriously disappeared in countries like Argentina and Chile for challenging the government of the day. And we think this won't happen in our society. But it may be a lot closer than we actually realise. In fact, I believe that potentially we in the UK are in a much more delicate position in terms of our future lives than people were in Soviet Russia. And this was brought home to me by a friend who's Russian, she's about my age, she spent all her childhood, youth, and young adulthood in Soviet Russia. And she observes that Russia, in Russia, all through the Soviet period, the population knew that everything that appeared in the media was a complete crock. So nobody believed it. In fact, the only reason that people watched the TV or, or watched or read the newspapers was to um, you know, see what bullshit was actually being presented to the public as news today. And then, of course, they were openly talk about it um, you know, with, with their friends and, uh, and colleagues. And she observes, in the UK, we are in a much more dangerous position because she, rightly, in my opinion, perceives that to be very much the situation in the UK with the one very significant difference, and that is the vast majority of people still believe what is being presented in the media to be the truth. Because we're at the anniversary of 9-11, I'm just going to take the opportunity to remind you of a few of the perhaps less known anomalies about 9-11. Because as time goes on, there is a danger that some of the less known anomalies actually get consigned to the trash can of history. And this is, of course, exactly the way they work. It's why history is written by the winners. All you've got to do is get over the first few years, because after that, you can basically write the official version of events, and that's what's taught in the schools. And if anybody's in any doubt that the US is rewriting history, then you need to be aware, if you're not already, that the, um, one of the last instructions of the Bush government was that all school books printed before 1985 must be destroyed. And the reason that they allege for this is because there was some problem with the glue used in the binding and it gives off toxic fumes. <laughs> now is it remarkable that that apparently was only the case in school books? And not in every other book. Why do they want to get rid of the book before 1985? Because, uh, interestingly, the books before 1985 probably actually had a fairly honest version of events. But there's been so much manipulation since 1985, particularly Gulf War I, and as many of you know, you know, I was first-hand experience in um, Kuwait in the immediate aftermath of uh, Gulf War I, and it was absolutely and undoubtedly, in my opinion, the American Special Forces that set the wells alight. But of course, despite the fact that the Iraqi government always claimed that they did not set the wells alight, of course that has never been allowed to be published. But it's a classic case of history being written by the winners. This is one issue of 9-11. This is Ted Olson and his wife Barbara Olson. Ted Olson was the Assistant Attorney General at the time of 9-11, and he was one of the first people to go public and state that he had received a phone call from his wife, who was on one of the planes involved in the events of 9-11. And it was actually this issue of phone calls that finally convinced my nephew, my wife's brother's son, who is an ex-US ranger, and his speciality was military communications. When he came over in 2004 to spend some time with us, with his father, I spent pretty much, I took advantage of their presence and uh, certainly spent sort of two weeks trying to show them that there were certain anonymous events about 9-11 which didn't support the official conspiracy theory. Well, they sort of took it on board, to be fair, they didn't like what they were hearing. But Chris, the nephew, when he got back, he did his own research. 
And he wrote back to me, and I still have an email from him a few weeks later where he said, Uncle Ian, you're absolutely right. He said, you know, my specialist area is the communications and the phone calls that were alleged to have been received from the planes could not have happened. So that was his trigger. Everybody has a different trigger to realise that uh, things aren't quite as they should be. This is an interesting photograph, isn't it? Now, I must confess that I have spent uh, you know, quite some time over the past few years trying to establish whether or not that photograph is genuine. Now, there are you know, counterclaims either way as to whether it is genuine or not. But one of the things that did strike me about that picture was its similarity to this. And this is a sculpture that was made by Rudolf Steiner nearly 100 years ago. And it was Rudolf Steiner's interpretation of the Araman who he believed to be the ruler of this earth at this time. And if we have time this evening, we'll touch back on some of the more esoteric aspects of what's occurring right now. One of the things that I had uh, realised when the London bombings were going down, and, and I got up that morning and uh, I live in the southwest, and I received a phone call from my son, who lives and works in London, Say, so, Dad, switch on the television. Something happened here. So I watched, as I'm sure many of you did, events unfold in London through the day. By five o'clock that evening, I was in absolutely no doubt that the London bombings were a contrived event. I spent the next two weeks full time researching in as much depth as I possibly could the anomalies of the 77 bombings. And this is a slide taken from a presentation that ironically I was giving at the Glastonbury Symposium at exactly the same time on Friday, July the 22nd, 2005, when Jean Charles de Menzies was being assassinated at Stockholm <coughs> Tube Station by British Special Forces. How do we know that? Because they killed him with dumb dumb bullets. 11 dum dum bullets to be precise, 7 in his head, 3 in his shoulder, and 1 missed. They probably missed because 7 dum dum bullets in the head probably didn't leave too much to shoot at. But one of the things that struck me as I was researching was the template. And you know, I don't have the time this evening to go through each of these items in, in detail. But basically, it was exactly the same template that was used in the London bombings as was used in the 9-11 um, uh, events. You know, the documents, the personal documents that allegedly survived, you know, initially we were told it was Mohammed Atta's passport that floated down. You know, and I think we all wanted to fly on planes built of whatever material that passport was made of because it seemed to have been indestructible. Of course, if we later realised it wasn't Mohammed Atta's passport, it was one of the other hijackers, but Mohammed Atta, the genuine Mohammed Atta, actually phoned his father the following day, because the genuine Mohammed Atta was a student in Germany at the time. He phoned his father to say that if he could understand what was going on, it was obviously a namesake, because he was still alive and well. well unfortunately, that phone call probably cost him his life, because he certainly wasn't alive and well for very long after that. But this Mohammed Atta had had his passport stolen which he had reported to the German police in 1999. So it was a classic case of identity theft. Of course, in the UK then, um, we had um, Mohammed uh, Sadiq Khan's driving license, which miraculously turned up at three of the locations where the bombs went off in London. So somebody screwed up, because obviously they had a bunch of documents and they couldn't remember what they were supposed to leave where. The prior knowledge, John Ashcroft, the US Attorney General, um, was told to avoid flying on commercial aircraft from July of 2001. Benjamin Netanyahu received prior warning. He was staying in the um, Great Eastern Hotel at Liverpool Street on the morning of the London bombings. Interestingly enough, as was Rudy Giuliani, who was, of course, mayor of New York at the time of the, the bombings. Somebody made a shit pot of money by putting options, put options in the US stock market against stocks that would inevitably collapse in the event of 9-11. And somebody did exactly the same on Sterling, because Sterling dumped 
on the, on the morning of uh, July the 5th, 2005, it dumped by 5%, one of the biggest dumps in a single day.